he would be very happy to see you. So many people who now enjoy his art can seek the truth about his mysterious death. Was it a suicide or murder? An honor killing? You decide. See what you think by the end of this. This is the book, Killing Vincent, The Man, the Myth, and the Murder. And the man is obviously Vincent. The myth is the suicide, and the murder is what we're going to talk about. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll believe that Vincent Van Gogh did not commit suicide, he was murdered. And then you'll want to know why, and who, and all the rest of it. So it's the biggest cold case in our history. And this book, by the way, is now available at the gift shop, right? <laughs> it's also available all other places, too, but there's some copies here. So I'm going to go through his art and stuff fairly rapidly because this is not really about his art. This is really about him and his love life and his murder. So the Dutch period, Vincent only painted for eight years, or less than 10 years, from the beginning to the end. So everything you see, all 1,400 pieces of art that he created was done in less than a 10 year period. So the Dutch period, and this is his most famous painting from the Dutch period, the potato eater. In Paris, when he finally got there, you see Antwerp and other places, he got to Paris and he lightened his palette much clearer and lighter. He was working and influenced by the Impressionists. And then he went from Paris to Arles, and this is one of my favorite paintings. I just love the colors. And this was painted at, uh, at the Mediterranean Sea of St. Marie's. And uh, this is the favorite picture of mine from that Arles painting. More famous, probably, to many people is the sunflower. And he painted nine of these. And he wanted to decorate Paul Gauguin's room when Paul Gauguin came to stay with him in Arles. In Arles, Vincent lived in this yellow house, and Gauguin joined him. And this is a famous painting Vincent made at his bedroom. Then you all had, he had this, what we would call an ear episode. And this is Paul Gauguin painted by Vincent. This is Gauguin's painting of Vincent in the Sunflower. And this is what they did. They lived together for two months. They ate, they drank, and they went to the brothels. <clears throat> so I think the year episode is related to a menage a trois between Paul Gauguin and Vincent and their shared prostitute, Rachel. And that's another whole story. And medically speaking, Vincent had these attacks, and they were described, and people thought they were a seizure disorder, epilepsy. And that's what he was diagnosed with in 1888 and 89 when he was admitted to the asylum for epileptic and lunatic. But in his own handwriting, he wrote La Vertige in French, for which there's no other translation other than vertigo. And vertigo is the classic hallmark in the diagnosis of maniac disease, mid ear disease. And that's what Vincent had. That's what his attacks were. And I wrote the cover story uh, for JAMA in, 18, uh, in 1990, 100 years after his death in 1890. And that was a cover story again that he had many years of these and not epilepsy. So I've been dealing with Vincent for 30 years. <laughs> so um, anyway, he went from Arles, where he cut off the pigs to hear or the pigs that they treated him, and he went to the asylum for epileptic and lunatic in San Marino. And this was the window of his room looking out onto this garden. And he painted some magnificent paintings when he was at the asylum. One of the most famous is Starry Night. He, uh, he left the asylum, and he came to auvers sur Lise, about 20 miles north of Paris. And these are pictures, these are paintings that he made uh, of what Aubert looked like at the time. And when I went there uh, in 1990, this is one of the pictures of a, a house that was restored. And uh, this is a picture of what the countryside looked like in the fields. 
and this is where the Rubuian was in 1990. This is what it looked like in 1890. And this is where he died in that room. You can tell because that room had the skylight window. So this is what Aubert looked like, and this is probably where he was murdered. And this is where he was staying, and this is the house of his doctor and Marguerite Paul Jr. And this is the train station, and this is the river, the oldest river. So the accepted story about what happened on the day Van Gogh was fatally injured is suicide. That's the most common story that everybody has heard. And but when you actually look at it and study it, there was no evidence of anything related to suicide. There was no focus, there was no planning, there was no intent. His letters and his art do not suggest a definite plan to commit suicide. And you know, as medical folks, you would not report someone as a suicide risk if they didn't express uh, focus, planning, or intent, or place, or whatever. It was uh, later figured out. So I re-examined all of these medical, mental, physical health issues, and they're detailed in the book in pretty much great detail. But I'm not really focusing on it now because nobody killed him because he had Meniere's disease or Asperger's or neurosyphilis. They killed him for another reason. So this, there's a couple chapters in the book that cover this, but it's not really pertinent to the discussion we're trying to focus on. So, okay, well here's uh, one of the um, storyboards from a movie that is coming out of this book. And so you try and figure out what's happening. I think you can probably recognize this is Vincent. And if you know the famous painting of Dr. Gachet, that's him. And I'll leave the rest of it to your imagination for now. But the movie script is uh, looking pretty good. So did they find the smoking gun? This is a gun they found all rusted in the field 60 years after Vincent was murdered. And they, the museum in Amsterdam claims that this is the gun that probably killed him, but they don't know for sure. And they don't know whose gun it was. And this is a sketch that I've made. And this is a gun, the exact same gun model uh, which I acquired, and we used it for all the forensic testing. And we'll talk about that later. So this is a Lafouche 7 millimeter pin fire revolver. And you can see that it has a folding trigger. It doesn't have the usual finger, or trigger guards that uh, most revolvers would have today. And this was very small. It fits in the palm of your hand. And women carried it in their purse. It was a concealed carry gun back in the day. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Um, we know a very limited amount about what actually happened to Vincent forensically. There was no autopsy, but we saw the accident or the murder. Nobody knows where it was. There was no suicide note, and the list goes on. So what we do know is that there was an entry wound right here under the left ribs into his abdomen. Okay, it took him 30 hours to die when he got back to the Rubu Inn. And he walked from we don't know where, but probably at least a half a mile or a mile. Climbed 17 stairs, was not short of breath, had no hemoptysis, uh, got in bed, seemed fairly calm and lucid and asked for his pipe. And it took him 30 hours to die. So, if Vincent was right-handed and he was going to shoot himself, and the, we know that the bullet went in here, if you take your little finger gun and try and do it, and you shoot yourself here, where's the bullet going to go? It should go out the left flank. Okay, but you all know about JFK and the, and the magic bullet theory from the movie, from the histories. Anyway, that bullet went through a whole bunch of different angles and stuff. This would be the predecessor magic bullet because according to what we're told or thought, asked to believe, that the bullet entered here and somehow made a turn back to here in the midline. 
And they use that as an excuse for why no, nothing could be done to try and remove the bullet or try to save Vincent because the bullet was too close to the midline of the great vessel. That's what they say. Right? So if he did get close enough to shoot himself, you know, we have to remember that the, these bullets were black powder pin-fired bullets. And black powder is an explosive. The stuff they buy off cannon. Black powder bullets are not the same as smokeless bullets that you have today. So in a simulation that we did with a plain blank, it created a great big powder burn. But very, very important is no description of Vincent's wound had a powder burn. Okay. They very specifically designed, described a small uh, entry wound with some circumferential discoloration but nothing black, it was sort of purplish tan and very small. So there was no powder burn. So could he get in a position to shoot himself? Technically pretty hard, but how did the bullet bounce back right at the midline? And if he did get close enough to do it, he would have had to have had a powder burn. There was no powder burn. So this is the mi missing magic bullet theory what we just described. If he shot himself here, and the bullet ended up here, that's pretty tricky. It doesn't really follow the laws of physics. The other possibility is that he shot himself here and it ended up down low, but most reports say it ended up here, and that's why they didn't try to save him. So I just call this the ABC. And if you think about that and try to put it into reality, it's pretty much impossible for Vincent to have shot himself. Now, there's an alternate theory, because nobody saw the shooting, the crime. There's no indication where the crime scene was, and there was no black powder. That wound that he had described could have just as easily been a knife, okay? We've probably all seen those in the emergency room, a little knife wound in the belly, a little thrust, and that was it. Well, this could do it. This was an interesting thing. This was an exciting. But this was what the, the Mafia in Paris carried in the 1890s. It was called the Apache Knife. And it was brass knuckles, a folding trigger revolver with a six shot, and a knife. Anyway, I found that in that. So. But we don't know whether, the point is, we don't know if it was a knife or a gun. And until someone produces a bullet in Vincent or in Vincent's coffin, we don't know whether it was a bullet or a knife. And with the amount of information we have, it could have equally been either one. So here we have a point blank range. You have to get a powder burn. And I'll show you some pictures of some of the reenactments. And here we covered that with a, a blue cotton shirt. And here you can see the powder burn as the bullet is spiraling out of the barrel. And the barrel is rifled. And that's why it has that twist on it. So you can see that. And then here's powder burn in the FBI ballistic gel that was behind all this. This is a paper target, cotton shirt, and this was behind it. And that's what we did on the first day. I'll show you some other stuff on the reconstruction and reenactment they did. But here, this is uh, the gun, the muzzle being fired, and this is the flame coming out of it, all right? And this, all this powder is the powder burn. And here's some previous Test because we used, we did like six or nine shots on one specimen. And you see that you don't see the bullet hole. What you see is a big hole with black edges. And if you saw it live, and it's in, on the website, on the, uh, you can see the videos. And you can see when the bullet hits it in slow motion that it makes a hole, and then you start to see a little red circle around it. And the red circle gets bigger and bigger. And what you're seeing here is that the cotton shirt is burned. So the bullet isn't that big. <laughs> All right? But I can tell you, if this was put up against your belly and fired, you would have a powder burn, and you'd probably have a third-degree burn. This is enough heat like an acetylene torch. Okay? So the fact that they didn't see anything on Vincent's body certainly should raise a lot of questions for anybody interested in the forensic aspect. And this is just more. There's 
there's a lot of this information in the book, and there's even more because all the you know, shots, the single frames, were taken from the videos. So you can see uh, in the videos all this information. So there's plenty of information to document that it was not possible for Vincent to self inflict his wounds. So you can see, you can see here's powder burn, and here, for example, at six inches, a big hole in a burn, even at six inches from a fire coming out the barrel, and the powder burn. Even at 24 inches, you can see the powder burn. So two feet away, you still get a powder burn. He had no powder burn on his skin. So he must have been shot at least two feet away or more. And the little bit of stuff that you see some, in some shots is called stippling. If it's not a big powder burn, it's called stippling. So here's Vincent. He's dead. He's in his coffin. If it was not possible for Vincent to self-inflict his mortal wound, whoever put a penetrating hole in his abdomen killed him. Okay? So if he didn't self-inflict himself, was this a premeditated murder and, and or an honor killing? Or was it just an accident? If he didn't do it, something happened. So are you convinced by the 21st century forensics that I showed you, and hopefully logical, deductive reasoning, that Vincent Van Gogh did not and could not possibly have committed suicide. So who are the cast of characters and the persons of interest? If you still believe after this presentation that Vincent Van Gogh shot himself, well, then he would be the person of interest. There's, there's, there's stories out now about a couple of keen hooligans from Paris who were summering in Aubert and they shot him. They were they were into being Wild West cowboys and Bill Hay, Wild Bill Hickok fans, and they out, went around town and threatened Vincent with a loaded gun. So there's one theory that these kids accidentally shot him. Then we have his doctor, a doctor's son, a doctor who actually wasn't there. We have his housekeeper, who had an art student, the people who stayed with him in, another artist. We have his girlfriend, daughter of the doctor. We have the, the carpenter who made his frames in his coffin. You can even guess the butler and the gardener. Okay. Or even his brother, Theo, which would be pretty unlikely. But there's people who believe that. So here's the two hooligans from Paris and Vincent being shot, either on purpose or by accident. But what really happened? What do I think happened? Okay, well, there's opposing stories. Whose facts to believe? Was it suicide or murder? Here's a picture of his doctor, a picture of his doctor's son, and the daughter of the uh, inn where he was staying, the Rue Inn. And she did not um, come forth with her story until the 1950s, and I'll explain that in a minute. This is her, and Vincent painted her three times in less than three days, all right? Now, what's interesting about Eileen is two things. One, she, it was unknown who this was in the painting until the 1950s. So there's these three famous portraits they know was done by Vincent, but they didn't know who the model was. And they were entitled The Lady in Blue for 100 years, almost. Well, not 100. 60 years. Anyway, uh, they put an ad in the newspapers throughout France because in the 50s they started to do the movie Lust for Life. Yes, sir. Irving Stone's Lust Hello. for Life. And yeah. uh, they wanted to talk to everybody who had a connection to Vincent. And she came forward and they, they finally identified and agreed that she was the lady in blue. So they changed the name of the painting. But more important than that, for us, was that Adam <coughs> recounted what actually happened. She was there when Vincent came back. She was one of the first people to see him coming back wounded. And she has written all this down and been interviewed three times back in the 50s. That describes a totally different story than what Dr. Gachet and his son perpetuated, which was 
what we today would call false narrative, false news. So the doctor, and everybody probably knows the famous portrait he did of the doctor, there were actually two of them, for Dr. Gachet and Mrs. Dr. Gachet's son. Are they possible suspects? Well, it's interesting. This is a very intriguing painting. Uh, it was done by the son, Paul Jr., who went under a, a pseudonym in 1904. And he entitled the painting, Place Where Van Gogh Committed Suicide. And you have to scratch your head and say, how did he know where Van Gogh committed suicide? Because they don't have a crime scene. They don't have any witnesses. But anyway, he painted it. So it's a question, was this sort of a confession? Okay. And here is his father. If he was murdered, who killed him and why? Who are the persons of interest? Who is the perpetrator, the facilitator, the disinformant, the disinformation agent, and the patsies? And I cover them most all around the book. But here is the father of Vincent's grave. And here he is again. And it's interesting that both brothers are buried side by side. You saw that photograph I had uh, in the very first slide. So he's visiting the graves of both brothers many years after, the, after their murders. And I'm saying their murders because I believe Theo Van Gogh was also murdered. And he had a very mysterious death within six months, less than six months after Vincent died. And he got sick within less than a month, sort of went nuts, attacked his wife and his baby and all kinds of stuff, and ended up very sick and dead. Could be poisoned, okay, by the doctor who was concocting all kinds of herbs and stuff in his garden. <clears throat> so the why, and we're really probably how do I know why he was murdered? Finally, love. The honor killing of Vincent Van Gogh and the tragic spinster life of Marguerite Gachet. And this is the working title right now of the screenplay that we're going to be shopping in a few weeks in New York. So it's based on the research from this book. So I'm going to stop there or I can go on. If you have questions, I'm happy to take questions. Your preference. I mean, I can talk about lots of this and lots of different aspects of it and bore you to tears or whatever, but if you want, I'm happy to answer questions. No questions? You want me to just keep going? Yeah. <laughs> well, Vincent had many failed attempts in the arena of love, marriage, and romance. And then Marguerite and finally love. Well, when he started out, he first went to London and fell in love with the teenage daughter of the owner of the boarding house he was staying in. And he got really, you know, was he young? He was 18 or 19. He went over the top, fell in love with her, and she was actually engaged to someone else, but he didn't know it. He left London very upset, went home for six months. And then he ended up in Holland, and he had several affairs with a peasant woman and a neighbor woman. And the neighbor woman actually seemed to fall in love with him, but things didn't work out, and she attempted suicide with strychnine. Then he moved to Antwerp, and Vincent was always looking for models for his paintings. And often the only ones he could get to model for him were prostitutes. Okay, so he ended up with a prostitute named Sien who had a four or five year old kid. And so he took them in, lived with them, painted her. And so this is a very famous uh, piece he did called Sorrow. And then uh, before that, he also fell in love with, very quickly, with his cousin, who had a child, a three, four-year-old kid, and had just lost her husband the year before. He totally disregarded her loss or anything and just professed his love and 
one of the things Vincent had was a real problem of boundaries and friendship. And <laughs> okay. And I think it's a component of Asperger's. I think that Vincent was not as crazy as people have made him out to be. They just didn't understand him and they couldn't understand his art. And if you add in Asperger's, it goes back to his childhood. He couldn't relate to people. He had a real problem. And um, he couldn't maintain friendships. He absolutely destroyed them, being argumentative and stuff, shortly after they were created. So I believe he had Asperger's. And I don't think he was certifiably crazy. He did some strange things, I'll grant you. So I don't think he was actually insane. So the expert was really funny. But anyway, he got past all that stuff. The ear episode in Arles, he ends up going and self-admitting himself to the Asylum for Epileptics and Lunatics in San Remi. And he's there for literally a year. He has nothing to drink, any absinthe or any of these other things that he may have been exposed to or not available to him. He eats, he sleeps, he takes these cold baths, he does nothing else but paint and reflect. And it's interesting because <coughs> partway through his time in, at the asylum, he stopped doing all these self-portraits. And I believe he did the self-portraits because to do a self-portrait, you have to sit there and look in the mirror. You look in the mirror, you kind of look at yourself and try and figure out what's going on. And I think he meditated and I think he did a lot of thinking. And by the time he left the asylum, he didn't need to do the self-portraits anymore. He didn't do anything before the time he left until the time he died. So anyway, he got to to uh, Aubert sur Lise, and he meets Marguerite. And um, these are sketches of Marguerite. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this because this is a painting of a peasant girl, a peasant woman. And so is this. And I'll show you some more detail about this because Vincent and Marguerite fell in love. All right. It's not very much discussed in the literature because the person who controlled all that information was Johanna Bengo, who was Theo's wife, who got all the letters and the art after Vincent died. And that was her life. She took all the letters, organized them translated and published the first book of the letters in 1913, and was her career was taking care of Vincent's legacy. So she wanted a very perfect legacy. The family was perfect, and the brother's relationship was perfect, and it really wasn't. And part of the thing was she swept under the carpet the whole story about Vincent and Marguerite. So we'll talk about this some more. But this was Marguerite in later years, and here's Marguerite in very later years. She survived Vincent by 59 years. Now, why are these pictures interesting? If you follow my story about Vincent and Marguerite's love affair, which was documented by Marguerite's best friend when she was 20 or 21, to an uh, investigative reporter years later, this is a very famous painting of Marguerite in the garden. Okay? No real facial detail. All right? But this is Marguerite, straw hat, white lawn dress, and this is painted at a distance. He painted this because the doctor, when he first arrived there, invited him to his, his home and his garden to paint. And so he did, and he saw Marguerite, and there was this connection. And so he painted her a distance, but the doctor was very upset with him because he didn't have his permission to paint his daughter. By shortly thereafter, they fell in love. <clears throat> so when you fall in love, you like to have a picture of your loved one. So he made sketches. And I believe this was a sketch. And if you put this side by side with this on the same scale, it's not too hard to recognize that this is probably the same person. So this is the full picture, and this is what we did in the book, is we made this the same size as this side by side, so you could make that comparison. Now here's another. This is a sketch, and this is obviously the painting of a sketch. 
these two things were done within a day of each other. All right. So now this is also entitled peasant girl or whatever. Now if you look at the details here, this woman has a nice dress. She has a nice button. She has an earring. She has a nice hat with a bow. I don't know for sure, but it doesn't smell right to me that this was a peasant woman. Okay, and I think that he declared it. Uh, he didn't actually name these things. These were named by art historians in Johanna years after they were painted. So it doesn't ring true to me that this was really a representation of a peasant woman anymore in this way. You see, they both have the same blue ribbon. So it's probably the same person that painted them in a day of each other. My theory is that Vincent sketched her because he could knock out one of these big paintings in two or three hours. He could paint two or three canvases a day. So the sketcher was not a big challenge. So I'm sure that he sketched her and painted them back in his little studio at the inn. And if you look, the background in here and the background in here is like wallpaper. There's no detail, there's no depth, there's no perspective. So I don't believe that this is a peasant woman. I believe this is Marguerite. And when you correlate the time these were painted with what was happening in their lives, this makes sense. And at this point, he's still painting her without the doctor's permission, but they're already in love. This is another painting the day after the other ones. Now, this is really interesting because this painting was initially attributed to 1888, which would have put it in the Arles time long before he ever got to Auvers. Now, recently it's been upgraded to being painted the day after the other ones. Makes sense. This is probably the best portrait and detail of what Marguerite Boucher really looked like when she was 20, 21 years old. So, the Arlesian was an art historian. That's it. Then finally, Dr. Gachet gives Vincent permission to paint his daughter. And this is a very famous painting of her at the piano. Um, and we'll talk about this. Why would Vincent accept total responsibility uh, for the accident or his death? Because he actually went in after he got back to the inn and he said, don't blame anybody else, I did it myself. Why would he do that? And, he didn't, and it wasn't possible for him to do it. Okay, he, didn't, he didn't commit suicide. So, because he's trying to protect Marguerite. Now, this picture, which really is pixelated, I'm sorry, but magnificent and real. And real and, uh, but anyway, this is a portrait of Van, uh, Van Gogh with a top hat and Marguerite being walking down the aisle, so to speak, in the Church of God in, the, in nature. Okay, and at that time, uh, I think Vincent came to, to show the world and document that they were already married in the eyes of God. So, now you got any questions? <laughs> slides next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a question? I do. My, How come their hair color is different? Or was oh, that those two me? paintings? Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, we don't know. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we don't know for sure. This is all theory, but, you know, artistic freedom. And if you're trying to cover up that this is really Marguerite mm -hmm. from the doctor, maybe you would change the hair color. So you wouldn't suspect that it was painting of his daughter, even though it finally looked like his daughter. That, that would be the guess. It's a guess. It's a good question. Yes? So is your theory that the father shot Vincent? Getting close. Father and... His son? Yes. Because he didn't have permission to romance well, they didn't really want Vincent in the family. Okay. They accepted him as an artist. 
but I don't think they really wanted him as part of the family. And the brother had a real problem with Vincent, as most people don't know about. But Vincent, like I mentioned before, had this great need to have people to sit for him, to paint. He painted Adeline Le Boulle three times. He painted back to the shape, two major portraits and an etching, okay? He never painted Paul Jr., despite the fact that Paul Jr. and the father virtually begged Vincent to paint him. Vincent just didn't like the guy. He didn't <laughs> want him around, okay? And um, Vincent, initially, in the very early stages, was very much appreciated by the father, who looked on Vincent as great, because he couldn't do what Vincent did appreciate it. And the father had this fairly substantial collection of other Impressionist artists. Now Vincent was post-Impressionist, but he had Monet and you know, uh, Renoir and a whole bunch of, he had a great art collection. And he had a good eye. And he knew that Vincent was going to be great. So maybe one of the other reasons he never wanted to put him out of, him out of the way was he wanted his art, which literally Within 20, well, within an hour or so after Vincent was buried in the ground, the father and son went back to the Rebellion with a big wheelbarrow cart and took all the art that they could cart away, literally. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they had that at home. They both wanted to be artists, the father and the son. Remember, the junior painted that painting saying, This is where Vincent was uh, committed suicide. So, they tried to make copies of his art over the years, and they had all this art that nobody knew existed as Vincent's chain started growing. So guess what they did? Forged a bunch of copies and sold them into the market. And it took the experts years to sort through that because in 1950, <coughs> roughly, Marguerite, who died in 49, and her brother donated a bunch of art the museum. Now that sounds very generous, right? You would think. But the real story is that they did that because the forgery ring, the gaché forgery ring, father and son created, got busted by the French government in order to get him out of prison. Almost sounds like something going on in Chicago. <laughs> to get him out of prison. <laughs> he, uh, he donated all this art to the to the Louvre, okay, and so they expunged his record, literally, and the year after that they gave him the, the French Legion of Honor, highest award to a non-military person. So that was that was a pretty big deal. So there's a lot more to all these little stories that were just sort of tickling. On the well, I mentioned that, uh, well, there's some people that think that he had, as a precipitating event, an attack of many. He had vertigo or something, and he had tinnitus. And so that he maybe cut off his ear to get rid of the source of his problem. My theory is that he might have had an attack of many. We don't know. But my theory is that he and Paul Le 